Hey everybody and welcome to Better at Beach. My name is Mark Burrick and if you are in our course right now, this is the Logan Weber Masterclass. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome. We are going to go through Logan Weber, who is an AVP player, one of the top blockers in the United States. We're going to go through one of his matches on Stadium Court at the Manhattan Beach Open. AVP, Manhattan Beach Open, Stadium Court, playing with absolute legend John Hyden against Young Phenom at the time, Miles Partain. Um, you know, you can't call him a newbie anymore because he's he's definitely starting to crush it. And his partner at the time was Paul Lottman. So if you're in the course, this is a part of Logan Weber's masterclass. If you're checking this out on YouTube, welcome. What we do is this is probably just an ad, but if you become a part of our complete player program, we do video analysis and that's what's going to happen here. So you'll open a library. You'll have Logan Weber's masterclass. You'll have Hagen Smith's masterclass, Travis Maywooders, and all of our courses and workout programs. And you can wait, make your way through that program just like Pablo, who is on screen uh, right now does. He's one of our elite members. So he gets to sit in with me, former AVP player and current AVP coach, and Logan, who's a current AVP player. And he's gonna sit in with us because he's one of our elite members and he gets to have his video analysis analyzed on another uh, video that you might be able to find if we link it here. If you're interested in it and you want my 36 best beach volleyball drills, as well as three free vertical jump workouts, all you got to do is click on the link around here. If you're already in the course, welcome. Thank you. Let's get to the show. Logan, my guy, I want you to introduce this match. Where are we? What's going through your head? What's your partnership? Sure. Yeah, we. Uh, this was the 2022 Manhattan Beach Open. Um, I believe it is a Friday, Friday afternoon game. Um, John and I were. Let's see. We would be one match in, uh, one and zero, oh, I believe, at this point. Um, so we just played one match on Friday. Uh, we're playing this uh, second round match against Miles and Paul. Um, we had actually just lost a really close game to Miles and Paul in the Hermosa Beach Open, uh, maybe a month before this. Um, really close. It was, we actually won the game until I came down from a block and netted, which negated our win, and then they ended up winning. So, um, going into this game, like we knew, um, we could play play them at a really high level. Uh, this was actually just after Miles and uh, Miles and Paula just won the Atlanta AVP maybe two weeks before this. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was an exciting game. Anytime you get to play Stadium Court in uh, in Manhattan, it's always uh, exciting and a good time. So um, yeah, that's that is where we're at here. Cool. So here we go. Here's Miles and Paul now. You just played them without giving away too much. Are you actually six seven or are you six nine? What what I mean, I know what you might have written on the paperwork in college, six ten, six eleven, just to get recruited. But what's your actual height? Uh closer to six nine than six eight, but definitely not six seven. <laughs> All right. It's always better on the beach to measure yourself as smaller. Always better if you're getting recruited to college, measure yourself taller. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But we all get the game. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, now, I know this is a while ago, right? So this is uh, a few years. Mm -hmm. What do you remember what you were working on at the time? What was important to you in terms of winning this match, what you're focused on, and maybe what you and John were working on? Yeah, John and I, um, whenever we were playing Miles and Paul, we actually tended to go at um, at Miles a lot more just because we didn't want him to let him do his jump setting and his uh, his option attacks. So to us, we always felt like the, the weakest point in this team's game was Paul's setting. Mm -hmm. um, and then for me, I've always had, at least when he's hitting on the third contact, I've always felt pretty good um, blocking against Miles uh, as long as I... I had a big focus here on just keeping my hands low um, and not reaching too high for this ball. So you'll see a lot of like blocks that look 
kind of like ball blocks more than line or angle blocks. Um, so I basically go like straight on Miles's left shoulder since he's left-handed. And then I'm basically thinking about blocking both of the low, um, the low angles with my hands. Okay. You said, uh, you said maybe you're trying to pick on Lotman's setting. Mm -hmm. How would you typically, whether you're at B A double A, um, N C double A or pro level, how do you pick on somebody's setting? Do you just rely on it? So do you just serve somebody and kind of wait for a bad set or how do you exploit that? I mean, a lot of the times it isn't necessarily the the difference between uh, like we're not looking for an overset on every single play because if somebody's oversetting on NBA, like nobody at a certain level is going to overset or have a bad set on every single play. So a lot of what we do just comes down to what's the what's the most likely percentage play to get us to score a point, right? So for me, the the thing that I don't want playing against this team is I don't want miles to be able to hit his option ball and make me have to think about jumping or not jumping with him all that stuff so that's my first thing and then it's just kind of helpful in addition to that that we felt like paul's setting was a little suspect at this point um so just making him do it over and over and over and maybe the first 10 sets are great but then maybe that 11th set isn't necessarily a bad set but it's just not exactly where miles want it wants it so then my percentage of possibly scoring that point goes up um, versus us kind of playing straight into what they want to do, which most teams typically serve Paul. And then Miles is able to give him really good sets as well as being able to do his tricky jump set stuff. So basically we're trying to make this team play more traditional because they want to play that jump set fast offense type of game. Okay. Okay. Nice. Now, is, is there a way to stop a jump setter? You know, I, like what, what's the strategy? Some, now, I guess a lot of people are starting to play against jump setters and everybody's got to figure out how to blockers have got to figure out how to prepare better earlier, be more athletic and now start making big time fast lateral moves. But mm -hmm. is there a way to just neutralize jump setters or a way to definitely not play against somebody who's jump setting? I think the biggest thing for me is just to have have a plan going into every serve. Like, what are we doing if this person's going to hit on two? Because a lot of the times the the issue comes when there's confusion with the defense. Um, we got pretty pretty lucky on that one right there. Um, but if you notice, like I'm fully committed at this point two blocking miles. Like I probably don't even step out here a little step out, but then I really quickly get myself back. Um, and because this ball is a little bit tighter again, I'm just playing the percentages on this. So if it's a little bit tighter, this is going to be a really tough jump set to make because that ball is a little bit tighter. Um, so if I'm at a point where I can almost just surround the ball with my hands, I'm going to jump with that every single time and make, make the other team make the more difficult play. Um, but getting back to just having a plan every time, like Hagen and I have a, a default, um, in terms of if the, if the other team is hitting an option ball, I'm definitely taking this side or I'm definitely taking the other side. And that way there's not that little bit of confusion because typically if you play, if you play the second contact, like it is the third contact, right? When we, when we set up blocking calls and we call line or angle or four or three, we know we have a plan for that. So a lot of the teams though, they they don't account then for the option as well. So when I'm defending anybody that likes to option a lot, we were playing uh, Tim and Kyle, Tim Brewster and Kyle Friend uh, this morning and they like to option a decent amount. So we just have a default where it's like, okay, if, if Tim passes, I'm taking the right side of the court on two, no matter what. And that way there's not the indecision and we're just we're setting up a play the exact same way that we would do if somebody was hitting on the third contact. Mm. Okay, so absolutely have a play call four on two and on three. Correct. Yep. I guess it's kind and of and you can make that a, you can make that a default as well. Um, it doesn't have to be like I don't need to call. You know, if I'm putting out my my calls, I don't need to say, hey, this on two and this on three. 
it can just be as simple as okay maybe maybe there's a little bit of wind so here in manhattan in this video there's probably a little bit of wind coming from the bleachers side in this so mm -hmm. from the ocean side and maybe i would just say hey on every single there we got double contact i think on paul's hands there as well um maybe i'm just saying every single on two option the blocker is going to block the strand side and i'm just going to put my defender on the quote unquote bad side right so that way i'm increasing the probability of my defender being in the right spot okay it's a good quick snap quick approach interesting that miles is just sitting middle there I wonder if he's just not ready to set up, if he was waiting to hover in the middle and then make some plays. That's a nice. Yeah, game. I think a lot of the times on kind of broken plays, since my pass was pretty bad at the start there, mm -hmm. um, taking the meat of the court on defense like Miles does there is is always a good bet. Um, me hitting a, a super crispy cut shot from the left side back that way after John just did like that run through set is going to be really difficult. So the, again, the higher percentage swing for the attacker is to hit that middle ball. Okay. Yeah, that's true. When you're uncomfortable, you're not trying to, well, <laughs> I think smart players, there's a weird cascade, right? Where <laughs> so, amateur players, people who make consistent errors, they try to do a ton of problem solving as yeah. soon as they get a bad set and then they're going, Oh, what do I do? Maybe a cut's still open. Maybe a high line's still open. Maybe I can rip this. Uh, or they just stick with whatever they had in their head, regardless of whether it was a good or a bad set. And then you yeah. get to open level players, guys who can win a couple in the qualifiers. And those are the guys who have figured out like bad situation. I'm not going to hit something extreme i'm not going to problem solve so they've got a very generic swing uh and that is where those middle things come and then there's that line of like amazing players elite mm -hmm. players where those guys have this little combination of safety safe but difficult for the other team i think nick lucena was one of those guys who was so able to even when he couldn't get kills consistently the other team was always in so much trouble scrambling mm -hmm. that he inserted enough discomfort without making an error and if you look at his hitting percentage it was not fantastic ever um i'm sure tournaments he, he of course went to the olympics right so he's definitely a solid player but he wasn't taking over and, and put in hitting at like 70 percent, 65 percent in a lot of his matches there was just enough trouble to be uncomfortable without taking unnecessary risks when you're like when you're in a really bad position well and the other just to stay on nick for a second there too the nick is obviously a player that trusted his defense a lot as well mm -hmm. so a lot of that plays into it where it's like man if i don't trust my defense i really need to get a kill even on this bad set versus I'm going to, like you said, put the other team in a difficult spot, and then I'm going to trust my defense and my blocker, which it helps when you play with Phil, if you're Nick. Like, I'm going to trust Phil to get a block on this play instead of me trying to make a spectacular shot out of a bad situation. Yeah, right. How much do we see that in, if anybody who's watching is, is an American, American football, like NFL? Mm -hmm. People trust their defense. They might be four yards from a first down right or from the end zone and they're either giving it to the other team by punting right or they're going for a field goal because there's a certain amount of risk if you go for it and fail versus all right you know what we're gonna get the ball back because our defense is pretty lights out and when you play out percentages you start to figure out what percentage of the time can we get four yards you know uh from this situation and what percentage of the time does our defense stop the offense from scoring at all and yeah once you weigh those percentages you've got you've got your answers for the nfl and then same thing here most people while i was playing anyway for me um and most people when they're in transition in other words there's a crazy scramble play errors go way up compared to in serve receive so everybody's hitting percentage is lower 
uh, when you're not in serve receive off of a dig because you get super excited. You're all like fired up that I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna get this dig now. I'm gonna smash it, and then you're early and you forget to look and you go too extra hard. And, um, yeah, a lot of those people really really gotta go in a new direction and make a better choice with their offense. It's a nice swing there by Paul. It was something John and I worked on a lot uh, oh, you want me to this season it? in 20, 2022 is uh, I was I was so bad at blocking people that were trying to go high hand swing like Paul does here. Mm. Um, I remember the first time we played Taylor Sander, he probably hit high hands identical to this ball. 20 times in a match and I just never stopped it. So John and I worked a lot on the idea of like draping my hands over the net versus pressing huh. and knowing when to do that and when to not do it. So the, the difference is just a lot of people when they think press, they just think like low press right in front of you, which is great for like 80% of players. But then you get the, especially you get an indoor guy like Paul or like Taylor Sander and they're not, like Paul's not trying to go sharp on this, right? So then it's, okay, when do I, not only am I blocking line or I'm blocking angle, but am I blocking line for high hand swing or am I blocking low line hand? Um, and we we use the idea more of like, a, like draping my arms over the net. So basically my, I'm reaching high, but my hands are angled down versus trying to press super far in front. Ah, so it's kind of like putting up walls with a big roof on top. And exactly. Yep. Going over. I, okay. So against guys who are hitting super high, a la like indoor, indoor, or I hate to say this because John would yell at me, high level beach players. <laughs> yes. Yep. You ever heard that story? <laughs> um, I forget if it was Darty or Theo, uh, but John was like, no, like, we got to run that faster. And they said, oh, like an indoor set? He goes, no, like a high level beach set. <laughs> he was like, this is how you play beach volleyball. Yeah, I thought it was super funny to hear that. And very yeah, so like if I'm blocking, if, if we flip that on its head and I'm blocking against someone like John, I'm never going to do that because John's just going to chisel at my elbows the whole time. Mm. So it's, it's a tough thing to to kind of make that transition. And that's why whenever I was getting tooled before I played with John, my only solution was like, uh, press more, press more, press more. But that wasn't, it was just, no matter how well formed your block is, if somebody's just blasting here, you're never going to block that ball. Right. So there has to be a certain, certain period where you, like you said, you basically just wall off the court versus trying to press over too much. Okay. Nice. I, I like that thought. Uh, hi, we, we did, in Hagen's masterclass, we looked at your guys' match versus uh, Chile, and mm -hmm. we looked at the blocker. He didn't put his hands on the other side of the net once. Yeah, it was like he left his defender to get everything hard, and the blocker's job was to get everything soft. It, that's how it looked when they're dropping because his hands were 18, 24 inches off the net, just at like maybe three quarters extension, going up as high as he could, ready to try to just get any little mistake of a high line or a cut. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's it's weird to try to tell blockers. Number one, I don't think there's enough good blocking coaches. Yeah. Um, there, how many hundreds of thousands of, of six, three and under people are there who have done it at a high level? How many people who are between six, six and seven foot have done it at a high level so that they can speak from experience and knowledge and, and, you know, with that body type being able to calibrate and do what works for them. I don't think there's, there's enough good blocking coaches that you can really say, all right, they, they hit it on the head or they know this from experience. Yeah. You know, it would be so nice if like Phil and Furby, uh, even like Mike Lambert, if they just came back and, and coached our big guys you know, on the USA. Team. It's, it's interesting because it's also just, it's yeah. something that people, people don't practice at all, right? Like nobody, people go to a practice and they'll dig 50 cut shots in a row and then they'll dig 50 high lines in a row where if you, 
if you start to look at the statistics, like as a blocker to defender, if my defender digs and transitions three balls and I block three balls, we, we probably win mm -hmm. that set at least. But yet we spend a ton of time digging on defense, but not a ton of time blocking. That was one of, when I first moved out to California, that was one of the, the biggest strides that I made was it. I would go out with, uh, with Evie Matthews and it would just be myself, Bill Kolinsky and Theo. And Evie would just hit a ton of balls at us, just rotating through us three. And it, it was crazy to feel like, I get tooled two or three times and then it was like, what do I need to do to actually make that adjustment? Because in a game you might get tooled once and then you won't actually get a block touch for the next 10 points. And there's no correction that's made between that time. Sure. Yeah. It, man, I, I think everybody should feel bad for blockers because blocking is also one of the skills where you can do a hundred percent of the things absolutely yep. correct and get zero reward from it yeah yeah <laughs> that's got to be so frustrating as a hitter you do 100 percent of the things correct you get a kill you see that as a digger you know you get the dig um as a blocker you might do everything perfect consistently and then you're responsible for two points per set and you're elite yeah right that's that's crazy to try to stay patient and and believing through that process if you uh if you scroll back just a second this is a pretty sweet play by john this one right here yeah slappy what a set, set. yeah Dang. yeah see like even on that play getting a, a more successful soft block yeah like because i'm reaching a little bit higher and not necessarily going super low on this mm. yeah he goes like right into the angle from his serve so that's yeah. i think that's the third or fourth serve i've seen from john where he went straight down trying to burn lotman's line he's really got like a lot of line to line abuse during that match was that something that you guys were trying to do and what are the advantages disadvantages um I, I think when we were talking earlier about kind of how to stop jump setting um a lot of it like you still need a good pass in order to get some sort of jump set so the other way obviously other than just serving miles the other way you can try to get a team out of their rhythm is in this instance if we serve paul but serve paul tough enough that he's not able to get uh miles in like an aggressive position on two mm. um so i think if anything if we have probably a little bit of wind coming off the ocean here um going down paul's line it's tough for him to pull that ball all the way back across to like a hittable position for miles whereas if we were to serve paul's inside shoulder here it's a really convenient angle for him to get it kind of in front of miles versus as you see on this pass Miles has to come way over to Paul's side of the court because we pulled Paul far, farther over to his line there. Yeah, to make that angle, right, your hands have to be so far in front of you mm -hmm. to touch that pass, which means that you've got to take the ball earlier, which means that you have less time to react and set up a good angle. And if the other team's serving line to line, they've created chaos because that's the shortest path to you. So everything... Mm -hmm in the scenario where serving line to line to somebody's outside shoulder it is just wreaking havoc, I think, on an offense that wants to try to get the ball back to the middle. So I, <laughs> Jeff Alzina used to scream at us, line to line serves, line to line serves, line to line serves, like all day. He would just say line to line serves. And I specifically remember in Ljubljana playing uh, Schubert from Australia. And I just, all right, Alzina, we're down by four. I'm going to I'm gonna summon you right now. <laughs> so I just little jump serves right down the line of the young guy, and it happened. You know, he three out of the four passes just were so uncomfortable for him. And they weren't tough serves, but I was like, let me see if I can just lock him 
let me let me just lock them down the line and it just worked and then one of them danced enough for him to think it was going out and it hit the line it's that line of line serve i mean i john mayer says that the short serve is probably the most underrated uh play or skill in beach volleyball and maybe it is but i i definitely think that the line to line serve over and over and over again will create points mm-hmm. you know, that's so tough to get your hands in front of you or to create time and now the ball's behind you and you're basically passing without being able to see the target that you want to get it to hmm. yeah i'd like to see i'd like to see a team that commits to a hundred percent of serves for a match line to line line to line <laughs> Why not? Do I, do I do it too? Oh, no, I didn't do it. Okay, short ball. That's good. High, hard swing. Take a look at all the work. Great tough serve, overpass. After the pass, John's ready to hit. So you can see him waiting behind you, which is really nice. Something amateurs never do. They always charge. Um, he comes in ready for the hit, doesn't have it, so he can set. And then all of the footwork by you to get back behind 10 feet and then still get at least three steps in your approach. And then high hard cross for the win. Nice. Ooh, that was for set point. That's a good first set. All right. So, you know, now you're back there. You're in the, uh, in the player's box. What do you guys say to each other? Um, after a set like that, not, not much other than keep doing what we've been doing. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's easy sometimes to, to overanalyze in a situation like that. And I think, uh, for me, a lot of it is just like, okay, we, we have to start out passing and serving well, the next set, like we just won. The only thing that matters is this set is that we, we pass and serve better than them. Um, I think uh, a lot of the times people, as the game goes on, they get caught up a lot in things other than simple pass and set. And, uh, and just the, the better that is, like you saw in that very last play of that set, it was, yeah, we did a bunch of good stuff between the serve and everything else, but ultimately that play happened because miles overpassed. Mm. So, if, if, we're, if we don't get a tough serve and if Miles passes that better than that play and all of the, you know, the the waiting and the set and everything like that doesn't end up happening. Um, and I think as this goes on, because I'm pretty sure we lose. Yeah, I think we lose this set. Um, I don't remember much of it, but I assume that at some point there'll be some sort of passing breakdown or we'll start missing a lot of serves. That's what typically if you go from like a position of winning the first set, it's, you know, maybe you just pass better than you normally do. And then all of a sudden you turn into passing worse than you normally do. And it, it just kind of has a, a cascading effect um, more than, you know, small detailed things can get you a point or two in a set, but ultimately your passing and your serving are going to get you eight to 10 points in a set. Mm, yeah. I'm at, at minimum, right? I like, you yeah. can't pass it. Can't pass, can't set, can't play. That's a <laughs> really easy way to put it. But you don't – have you ever said the wrong thing or gotten the wrong mentality in the player's box after stomping somebody in the first mm-hmm. set or, or you know, getting stomped or, or playing? Have you, ever, have you ever just gone back and say, hey, we need to change because they're going to adapt when – maybe they haven't adapted or if you do stomp them do you start saying okay they're getting used to this we should change before they change or do you just keep hitting that money button yeah it's such a fine line um because you you never want to be the you you always want to be one step ahead right so it's okay, we, we blocked line that entire game and we won by six points, but now maybe they're on the other side thinking, oh, they blocked line that entire game. So I'm going to, you know, do X, Y, and Z to counter that. Mm. Or do you just keep what's like, stick with what's been working. And I think uh, 
with Hagen and I, sometimes we we tend to overthink the adjustments that the other teams are going to make versus just going out and we call it just like play stupid volleyball to a certain extent where it's like, okay, make them make an adjustment and make it work twice before I change what I've been doing. Because so often if I've been like blocking line for the entire first set and I win the set by six points and I step out and I'm blocking the first point of the game and I want to call like a, an angle block just because I, I want to be one step ahead of them, but they haven't actually beat my line block yet. So why would I want to change that? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it is an interesting, it, it, it's such an interesting dynamic. I, I talk a lot when we do our camps, especially when I'm with the, the kind of like upper courts, when we're doing defense, it's like my favorite thing to coach because once we have that foundation of like serving and passing and setting the, the mental game just becomes so entertaining to me in terms of trying to figure out what the other team saw, what happened. Um, and yeah, that kind of like that, that push and pull is just, it's really interesting. It's fun to watch like mid game, especially for me, like, I don't really watch volleyball now and just like watch it for enjoyment. Cause every time I watch a game, I'm like, Oh, I wonder if they're going to change that or why did they change that? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting with your partner as well. Like I like to, uh, I use the idea of like sequencing my block calls. So like if I, if I block a line and Hagen digs the hard cross and scores a point, I like to know when I'm going into playing a team, my, whenever people talk about like scouting for a team, Mm -hmm. my biggest thing is what does the team or what does the individual do after they make a mistake on a play? Right. So if I get, if I swing hard cross and get dug, there's typically two frames of mind. And one is I just swung, I got dug. I'm going to do the exact same thing, but I'm going to do it better. Or there's, I swung cross, I got dug. I'm not going to do that exact swing again for the next eight points, right? So, and typically it's, players hold pretty true to that, right? Like if I missed a high line shot, it might be seven or eight points before I come back to it. Or I might just say, I just missed my high line. I'm going to make my high line better and hit it this time, right? Mm -hmm. So once I know and can kind of eliminate one thing from your options, Now it starts to become really interesting because now let's say you missed a high line. I can say, okay, what can we do here knowing that he's not going to hit a high line on this play? Right. So how do I, how do I kind of use that as bait to get them to do what I want to do? So maybe if you just missed a high line when I was blocking one, I'm going to run a three the next time because the most vulnerable shot against the three is going to be the, the high line. So if you're already not thinking high line, now I can run a three and probably get you to either swing down the line or hit like a cut shot to my defender. Mm. Um, whereas some players, if if I blocked line and the other person missed a high line, they would want me to block high line again because they want the other person to prove that they can hit that shot. Um, so it's just interesting. If I would say when you're scouting other players, like even at if you're at a tournament and you're watching the match before you and maybe you play that next person, um, like what, what do they do when they make a mistake, right? And the most basic form of that is if they hit out or they hit into a net trying to full swing at a ball, the very next play, are they definitely shooting or are they definitely swinging again and just trying to hit it harder? Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say on a most basic scouting level, that's a, a really, really good point to try to pick up on before you start playing the game. One of my, one of my favorite types of player to play is like young meatheads mm-hmm. <laughs> because you know that like if they hit real hard they're gonna try to hit and you block them they're gonna try to hit real hard again but they will never go for that third one their partner yep. will put exactly. some type of pressure on them they'll feel some internal like man i guess everything about my heart is being shut down and then they go to the opposite side of the spectrum and it's like, we're peeling on the next play for sure. You know, because you yep. know that they just don't want to swing and get blocked in front of all their friends again. So it's, if you get two blocks on hard balls in a row, I would nine times out of 10, I'll throw that late squat and drop and like peel my blocker and get some shot digs for that third one. 
but yeah, then it is, then it is that, that difference in the type of player, you know, do they, do they switch what they're doing or do they just do it better? You yeah. know, and, and for some people do it better means wait, like I, I'm not going to change the swing. I'm just going to wait better or I'm going to look better because I know that I got dug, right? If I get dug on a high line, one type of player says I better hit hard. The other type of player says, I've got to look and hit that mm -hmm. high line because I forgot to on the last time. You know, so Yeah, Hagen and I started doing a kind of interesting thing where anytime, relatively anytime after the technical timeout, mm -hmm. if we um, – uh, keep pausing on that play real quick. I want to come back yeah. to that one. But um, if one of us misses two side outs in a row – it's just an automatic side switch for the next ball. Hmm. So if I'm if I miss two side outs and I'm playing on the left side, and we kind of feel that lull coming a little bit, where it's like, oh man, like we just missed a couple side outs, just instantly flip right, and there's not even a thought to it anymore because we both realized that we were very stubborn and we didn't want to switch because we just wanted to keep doing what we were doing but do it better, hmm. and just having one play of Hey, you're you missed two side outs on the left, switch to the right just for one play. And it's it's funny how just that mindset change and just coming from a different side can help you just immediately get out of that rut just because it changes something that the defense is seeing a little bit. Changes that um, also so yeah, long as ahead. you're like, hey, let me let me make the adjustments. Like just switching side isn't gonna do it. Right? Yeah. Switch sides and be technical. I think some people will say, hey, just switch but they won't change anything technical or like that's going on in their mind. they are like, Hey, let's switch sides and make sure you look from mm -hmm. this side, you know, or, or make sure you wait from this side. So I think that side switch is also going to come coupled with one of your generic basic things that you can control that everybody yeah. knows makes every hit better. Wait, look, stay behind the ball. You know, if we do all those, then instantly your your hitting goes up so don't forget guys if you are just switching sides uh to change it that's not going to automatically generate a point it's going to be switch sides and do better <laughs> okay uh talk, talk me through this point and then this will be uh actually we're going to shut it down after this so we're at almost 40 minutes sure um let's see so this is i think i hit a, a jump serve on this um jump serving hard and, and forcing a really high kind of off the net pass as we talked about at the beginning like that's putting a lot of stress on Paul's uh hand setting here right that was like a 30 40 foot pass he's having to push this ball out really far it's a really spinny ball so then as we we're kind of playing to our percentages here I get a ball that is it's very tight and very blockable um so just from kind of going back to what we started with obviously this is a ball that is relatively in my my zone of blocking like miles knows i'm there terror zone of terror. um huh your zone of terror yes yeah yeah he um, does a good so, job of recycling that i mean yeah. a lot of people will shrink and poke up under it and make an easy dig some people just continue to go hard and they'll get clamped i thought he did a nice job of padding it high and flat at, you know, 20% velocity so that he creates a relatively easy ball to cover here. This is mm -hmm. the smartest way, I think, to get out of a tight set. You know, if he was big and physical and he had his feet to the ball, maybe he does one of Paul's swings where he just rips your fingers off. But I thought this is such a smart play to recycle intentionally off of a block. Right, what happens here? Another tight set. Yep. Battle of the big men. <laughs> Goes for the Kong block. Weight roomed. Yeah, John does. John always did a real crazy good job on these kind of plays where there's not really a side, there's not a a line or an angle. He just reads that play really well. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously this is kind of thing that he's best known for, but he stays and he gets his elbow back so quick on these swings that he's still able to get full power, even though he's on the ground with like zero approach here. 
Um, I think a lot of people, when they don't have a full approach, they end up immediately defaulting to some sort of shot. Whereas for most of us, if we just bunny hop, I mean, again, I'm really tall, so this is definitely for me, but this is for a lot of people. If I just bunny hop and I get a full reach on this ball, I can still slap this thing fast to the back corner. I don't need to load up to swing to it, but if I reach on that, I don't need to default immediately to a shot here. I can just get on this ball quick and just think about slapping to the deep corner, um, which is something that obviously John does extremely well. Yeah, and people think that just because there's no blocker and there's two people down, now you got to load up with maximum power to get a kill. But it's if it's one of those shook up plays where everything is going weird, remember that for each hundredth of a second that passes the defense is setting themselves up more and more and more and getting more space from you so by that method they're getting more ability to react to your hits so more chances for digs whereas if you can accelerate your timeline you don't pull your elbow back quite as far you don't arch your yeah. back to swing you know you don't take a full jump which requires a full double arm lift and a full knee bend right those are all costly milliseconds whereas if i just like you said hop and slap right now i throw that jab i've got the ball to the back of their court before they're even in a defensive position and if more yeah. people could learn that uh, i call it a tap and slap um it's just tap your feet on the ground and slap the ball really quick you know instead of an actual volleyball swing and it's so effective in bang bang plays and i just uh, people don't get that until, I mean, for me, the people who I see do it successfully are the people who are getting top 10 finishes in the country and yeah. really no one else. Yeah. Cool. Well, Logan, thank you for this little masterclass and look inside your mind to a, one of your matches. Um, for uh, anybody watching now and later, uh, to John Hayden and his family and Samantha, uh, our, our prayers are 100% with you and so sorry and absolute tragedy. And it's been eating away at me every single night now that I've got a daughter. Um, and uh, we're so sorry. And if uh, you guys can send out your prayers and your thoughts and your good energy to the Hayden family, uh now and anytime they need it a uh, great family and uh, our prayers are, are with samantha for sure so uh we are going to wrap this one up and then we're going to do our private video analysis with pablo and guys if you do want to see more of logan's master class and you want to see full beach volleyball courses as well as our complete set of workout programs for beach volleyball players Click on the link around this video. You'll be able to find it and you'll be able to do what Pablo is about to do and get a private video analysis from an elite player, elite coach and uh, professional volleyball players. So uh, coaches also want you to know if you're here live that we are starting our full coaching program. The only way to get started really is by clicking the link around this video. If you're already in the course, I apologize for this little ad if we don't edit it out, but just know that we are now training coaches to help you reduce stress, get more time, get more enjoyment, and actually be able to teach technical and strategic skills at a really high level. Mm -hmm. So uh, links around the video, if you wanna check it out, if you're in the course, thank you. Let's go to the next video. Bye everybody. <laughs>